President Obama hits the road this week on a mission to sell his brand of fiscal responsibility to the American people. This just days after House Republicans approved their dramatic plan to tackle the debt crisis. At issue, a national debt that has ballooned to more than $14 trillion. The United States is now borrowing $2 million a minute. As for the plans, President Obama wants to end the Bush tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans, and he's calling for spending cuts, including at the Pentagon, and cost-cutting reforms to Medicare and Medicaid. Republicans are demanding steep spending cuts, no tax hikes, and a massive restructuring of Medicare and Medicaid that would fundamentally transform two pillars of the American safety net. The plans are worlds apart, and the clock is ticking. In a month, the United States will reach its borrowing limit. In order to borrow more money to meet obligations, Congress must vote to raise the debt ceiling, and getting Republicans on board may not be that easy. I spoke with Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner about the showdown and the stakes. Secretary Geithner, thank you for joining us. Nice to see you. The debt ceiling is going to be the next big battle. It is the next big battle. Can you really spell out in plain English for our viewers what is the impact if it's not raised for the United States and for the average American? Well, I want to make it perfectly clear that Congress will raise the debt ceiling. You're sure about that? Absolutely. And they recognize it. And they told the president that on Wednesday in the White House. I sat there with them and they said, we recognize we have to do this and we're not going to play around with it because we, we know that the risk would be catastrophic. And, it's, you know, it's not something you can take too close to the edge. So what they say in private is not quite what they say in public? Well, you know, they've said in public, too, that they recognize that America has to meet its obligations. Again, you know, this is just about the basic trust and confidence in the United States. It's about the basic recognition that we made commitments. We have to meet our commitments. There's no alternative, and they recognize that. What if it wasn't raised? What is the doomsday scenario? I'll be very direct about it, uh, and people understand this. Again, anybody running a business or understands this. What will happen is that we'd have to stop making payments to our seniors, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. We have to stop paying veterans benefits. We have to stop paying all the other payments, all the other things that the government does. And then we would risk default on our interest payments. And if we did that, we tip the U.S. economy and the world economy back into recession, depression. I think it would make the last crisis look like a tame, a modest crisis. It would be much more dramatic. The cost of borrowing would go up for everybody, and it would have a permanent devastating damage on our creditworthiness as a country. And that's why there is no responsible person that would take any risk that we allow the world to start to fear that the U.S. would court that, uh, that tragedy. Again, again, if you take it too close to the edge, then people start to wonder, <laughs> really, what are, what are we doing? What are they thinking? You, you seem to be confident. You're saying that they will vote to raise the debt ceiling. On the other hand, you're also leading quite a concerted campaign with Wall Street, with big bankers, to try to persuade uh, the Republicans, those who may be doubting this, that they have to do this. Well, we're so not, you're not sure. We're, we're not leading that because the business community is, wants to make sure that people up there understand. You know, remember, there's a lot of new people up there, and this is a hard vote for people. And, you know, there's been a little bit of a tradition that people play politics with this. So the business community is doing what you'd expect it to make sure people up there don't miscalculate. And, again, the people who would take this to the edge, to the brink, they'll own responsibility for calling into question our creditworthiness, and that would not be a responsible thing to do. I'll tell you what, what's the hard thing to do. The hard thing is not to raise the debt limit, because Congress will always do that, and they recognize that. The hard thing is to try to take advantage of this moment and get Republicans and Democrats to come together and lock in some reforms that will reduce our long-term deficits. That's, that's going to be, that's really important to do because the world is watching now and they want to know that Washington takes these things seriously and is willing to get ahead of this problem. So you see the Republican leadership say, and you see the President of the United States say, you've seen a bipartisan fiscal commission say, that we need to try to lock in reforms that will bring about about $4 trillion in deficit reduction over 10 to 12 years. When they all agree that we have to do it, they agree on the basic magnitude, the basic same basic time frame, then we have a chance now to get Congress to lock in some concrete targets, some concrete timelines, and an enforcement mechanism to make sure it happens. And I think we can do that. And yet, this week when the president made his speech, certainly many Republicans thought that they were sort of ambushed. And I don't think there's anything courageous about asking for sacrifice from those who can least afford it and don't have any clout on Capitol Hill. Is this the right tone, do you think, that will encourage people like Speaker Boehner to actually come together and, as you hope, get this thing passed? Look, we recognize, the President recognizes, and the Republicans recognize, this is something we have to do, and we have to do it on a bipartisan basis. Neither side has the votes to do this on their own, and you have to come together to do it. What can you give to the Republicans ahead of this vote? 
Well, let me step back for one sec. You know, we, in the years before this crisis, we were piling on a lot of debt. As a country now, we borrow about 40 cents for every dollar we spend. We're on an unsustainable path. And that, again, that's why it's so constructive and so encouraging. You see Republicans now and Democrats all saying this is an important commitment and laying out the same basic order of magnitude cuts that are going to be necessary. Now, we have very big disagreements on what the right balance is, but there are things we agree on we can lock in today. There are things we're going to disagree on for some time. We can take more time to resolve. But what we think we can do is lock in some targets for deficit reduction, specific time frame, ways to make sure those happen, that they're credible enforcement mechanisms. And we can agree on that now and still give us some room to debate and to disagree and to negotiate on composition of tax reform. Now that we're talking about budget cuts, and that's the whole conversation in Washington, is that going to damage the recovery? No, I, don't, I think we can do this, and that, that's a very good point. I'm glad you raised it. One of the reasons why you want to do this in a way that's balanced and has a medium-term plan, you know, it locks in changes over several years, is because you need to do this gradually so that you protect the recovery. And I think we can do that. But we can make these changes, if we do it carefully, without, I think, hurting the economy, without adding to the burden of the middle class, and without gutting or eroding investments in things we need to make sure we grow in the future. So the president also in his speech talked about revenue raising taxes, taxes on the wealthy. Well, I think it's important for people to recognize that we cannot afford to extend these tax cuts for the wealthiest 2 to percent of Americans. We, we can't afford it, and we have to do tax reform. So Speaker Boehner says that's a non-starter. But there's no surprise that, you know, they believe that. But I think, you know, Chairman Ryan's budget helps explain why this is going to be essential. Because if you want to extend these tax breaks for the top 2%, then either you have to ask me to go out and borrow trillions of dollars from the Chinese or from foreign investors or from Americans, from our children, or you have to cut, as he proposes to do, very, very deeply into basic benefits for seniors, the disabled, the poor. And we don't need to do that in order to restore balance to our fiscal position. Will raising taxes on the wealthy be enough to really make a dent in the deficit? Many economists are saying that you're going to have to raise taxes on the middle class as well. Yeah, very important question, and I'm glad you raised it. And, and think about it this way. If you, it's true we have to bring these deficits down, but if you do it in a balanced way that includes spending savings, reforms to health care, and tax reform, then you can do it in a way that has acceptable costs for the economy, preserves our capacity to invest, and doesn't add to the burden of the middle class. And the reason why that's true is because a huge, we have a huge amount of spending in the tax code, special tax breaks, that go disproportionately to the most fortunate Americans. So it is possible to do this. The president believes we can do this. I believe we can do this without adding to the burden on the middle class. Where would be the specific uh, reforms be? The president talked about closing certain loopholes and, and certain deductions for people. Where would the specifics well, be? The, the two basic foundations of this we think to be responsible are, again, to let the tax cuts, temporary tax cuts put in place under President Bush for the top 2%, let them expire. And the second is to reform the tax code by eliminating some of these special expenditures, special tax breaks, again, that go disproportionately to the wealthy Americans. Which ones? Remember, exactly? only 30% only of Americans itemize. And, and those benefits, even like uh, the, the mortgage interest deduction that lets people have two homes, pretty expensive homes, those are things, again, if you target them on the most fortunate Americans, they can afford to take a little bit larger share of the burden. They can afford to do that. The IMF, and there's the meeting this, uh, this weekend, has basically said that the United States is not doing enough right now to attack its deficit problem, and that dramatic measures, drastic measures, should be taken. Um, are you going to we, take think, any more drastic measures? I mean, they're right. complaining. We, I think we all agree, and again, it's important for people to recognize, Americans to recognize, that the world is watching us. They want to see, is America up to this? Of course we're up to this. We can handle this challenge, but it does require that we act. We can't just keep putting this off. We can't get behind this risk, because then if we do, then the world will lose confidence in us, and you'll see growth weaker, and Americans will pay more to have to borrow, and more of our savings will have to go to foreign countries. So we have to do this. And yet, your very close ally, Britain, is in a year or more of its austerity program, and the results don't look great. Retail sales are plunging, income looks like it's going down. I mean, that can't give 
you a lot of confidence, can it, on this austerity program? We're in fundamentally different positions, mm -hmm. uh, the UK and the United States. They, their challenges are much greater challenges. They had a much larger hole to dig out, a much larger financial system they had to reform, and they have a much harder road ahead of them. We're in a fundamentally stronger position. And although we have to move too to re reduce our deficits, I'm very confident if we do it in a balanced way that you can do this without putting at risk uh, this expansion. You have to do it gradually. And again, this is why you want to do it over a multi-year period of time. A lot of news this week, a lot of disappointment among many people that many of those big bankers and financial institutions responsible for the financial crisis have still not been prosecuted, punished. I mean, how does that bring confidence to the American people? Well, let me just say I, I agree that you saw a, really a, a huge loss of confidence in the average American in our financial system and how it works, whether it protects them from abuse, whether it's a fair system with the kind of integrity you need. And financial systems require trust and confidence. And you saw in this crisis just terrible mistakes, devastating loss of confidence. Do you think that some of these people should have been at least prosecuted, punished? You know, that's really a question for my colleagues in the enforcement. I know government. it is. I'll I know it's you, not your job. But yeah. in terms of trying to build confidence in the American I'll, people. I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I think two things are very important. One is we have to have a more stable system. We have to have a system that provides better protection for consumers and investors, and that's what we're building. That's what Congress passed, and that's really my job, to make sure that happens. But that is not enough. You also have to have confidence in the American people that our enforcement authorities will hold people accountable, make sure they abide by those rules. You need both those two things, and we're starting to rebuild that, and I'm very confident that we're going to be do a better job and be ahead of the rest of the world in doing that. So you've had uh, a pretty rough uh, couple of years. It's been a pretty thankless job in the trying to get out of this recession in a fragile recovery now. Secretaries Clinton and Gates have said they won't be around for a second term. Will you? I got a lot on my plate still, and we got a lot of challenges ahead. And I want to tell you, this is hard, but I believe in this work, and I enjoy these challenges. So you'll stay. Well, again, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna keep at trying to fix what's broken here, make sure we're, we're helping um, get the economy growing and help deal with these long-term challenges. Secretary Garner, thank you very much indeed. Nice to see you. Thank you.